Hey folks, I'm Kat Sheridan, director of the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery, and I'm here today with Ken Emmerich, our juror. We're going to have a look at the exhibition After Hours, Artwork by State of Ohio Employees 2021. Now a little bit about this exhibition, Ken, you know, we've had, this is our third iteration. The first one we did was in 1990, just after this building opened. Um, the second one was in 2017, and now we're here in 21. Um, we thought it was really important to make sure that you all knew there are artists all around us. Um, these are all state workers that have that fire of creativity burning bright in them, and they're bringing it to bear after hours. And what do you think? Well, thank you, Kat. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Ohio Arts Council, especially the Ohio Arts Council's board, Donna Collins, executive director, and all the staff uh, at the agency uh, for the opportunity to participate in this, in this exhibition. It's one that I've loved. I was fortunate I've been at to all three of the exhibitions. Uh, I retired uh, two years ago from the Ohio Arts Council. I was the director of the Individual Artist Program and the Percent for Art Program. And I would have to uh, shout out to my office mate, Kathy Signorino, who uh, shared so many of the adventures that I had working for the OAC. Yeah, absolutely. So with that in mind, you know, we have someone really vested in, in what it means to be a state worker, and then also the richness of being a part of the Arts Council and seeing the phenomenal creativity across the state. Um, so we're going to get started and talk about Jennifer Witten over here. Um, and the first piece is Button Trowel. And Ken, you want to talk a little bit about it? Sure. So um, Jennifer was one of the few artists in the exhibition that I knew the work immediately when I saw it uh, when during. Uh, she has been in, uh, in multiple ex this exhibition previously. Uh, and as an artist, I have uh, had the fortune of seeing her in many uh, different exhibitions with a lot of different work. Very excited that she applied and very excited that we were able to show her pieces. Uh, I was really drawn to this work. Um, it is, I think, uh, just core to her making. It has this beautiful beadwork, uh, this embellishment of these uh, found buttons. It's taking this very ordinary object, the trowel, which is used in labor and, and just sort of a very uh, industrial, constructive type of way and bejeweled it to make it almost iconic. Uh, the imagery on the top is this wonderful, um, variety of images uh, from classical to this uh, very sort of contemporary image down here. And then the beadwork ties it all together in this just phenomenal way. I, I really admire Jennifer's work because she is somebody that is working in sort of the base of a traditional craft technique, but really elevating objects and making these very high art, uh, very beautiful objects. Perfect. So let's let's kind of go around. We're gonna snake our way around the well, snake our way, and then we'll talk about why I said that in a moment. Um, next up, we're gonna talk a little bit about Brandon Duke, and Brandon Duke is also going to be one of our uh, programming options here. Um, I believe he is. Well, I'll have that date in just a moment, uh, but I'm gonna let Ken talk about this work. So. Um during this exhibition, um, it, it was really challenging because as you'll see as we move through the gallery, there's a real variety of work, uh, styles of work, etc. And, and actually that was on purpose of why they're here because I really tried to make sure that a lot of different things were represented in this exhibition. But there's also certain pieces that are, are very personal to me. Uh, Brandon's work is definitely work that uh, I, I really gravitate toward. I love the narrative. Uh, and in this case, he has used a found photo. I'm a, a big fan of, of vernacular photography, found photography. Uh, I actually got introduced to that formally through the Cleveland Print Room, through a wonderful uh, exhibition that they had there. I think what Brandon does is takes this photo that we've all seen. We probably all have this in our family archive. And he really elevates it, uh, creates his own take on the image, and it's just this sort of compelling, uh, the, the way he's used line has centered the, or off-centered actually, the figure. Uh, it has a story, it's unique to Brandon. I think I can read my own story into this piece. I think it's very enjoyable work. This piece here is called View 2016-2018, View from My Cubicle. Uh, the title alone made me smile. There are many, many, many hours I spend in my office cubicle. And um, he has a use of the house shape that is uh, iconic to him, that he has 
has incorporated here, but I can look at this piece and being on the 33rd floor of the Reif, I'm sorry, the Rhodes Tower, looking down at the State House, looking down around me, I recognize these patterns. And I really, really just appreciated and was drawn to this work. I love how he really flips perspective on a variety of views. So you have that over look and then the straight on and melds them together into this piece. It's really, really interesting. Brandon's workshop will be Saturday, June 12th. He's doing the Friends and Family Workshop. So if you haven't signed up for that, make sure you do. That is free and you can sign up at reifgallery.eventbrite.com. I'm going to pull us actually over into our flex space. This piece, Amanda, if you want to just go right in there and I'll talk loudly so you can hear me for just a moment and then I'll be quiet, I promise. This is Ted Hadamer. Um, and we made this room specific to be a listening room. Ted is a phenomenally prolific musician, um, and he shared a couple of albums to be played during this exhibition. Um, so I'll just be quiet and let you listen a little bit. He's got such a wonderful voice. All right, come on this way. Next up, Ken's going to talk to us about this artist. So when the artist applied for this exhibition, they could apply with up to three images. And there are times that I just selected a singular image. Uh, this is work by artist Kay Nees from Columbus. Uh, I immediately when I saw this work, I was really drawn to it. I, I, I loved the approach, this sort of soft, uh, this moonlight uh, that are, is featured in two of these images, and then sort of this ending uh, sunset uh, on the third. Uh, the way I juried this show was actually, I, I did a complete overview of everything that came in. And there were definitely pieces that struck me immediately. I knew that I had to include them in the show. And then there was quieter work that um, after looking at it maybe a third, fourth, fifth time, and eventually even looking at people's statements, drew me back to their pieces. So I think when you are during something uh, like this type of exhibition, it's a multi-layered process. With um, Kay's pieces, I found that these were all images take, taken on her iPhone. Uh, that was the source of the material, and then she went back and kind of revisited this. Her relationship to the exhibition title also uh, came to me when I read that uh, she quoted in her statement that uh, I was, uh, sorry, the paintings were created as an artistic exercise and a form of meditation. So the idea of after hours, you know, people creating, uh, in her case, it, it's a way to release tension, to meditate, to uh, really kind of uh, draw back from all that day-to-day -day stuff. I think they're beautiful gouache paintings, and I'm really happy that we could show all three of them as a series. Perfect. Now let's come around the corner, and um, we have works by, I, I wish we could talk about every single work, but you know we only have an hour, so we, we've picked some highlights. This is Michael Bush, and Michael Bush is going to have an artist talk for us um, Thursday, May 20th, from 6.30 to 7.30, so make sure you sign up for that as well. Um, we're going to hand it to you. Sure. So they, these are paintings by Michael Bush, who's also from Columbus. Uh, he's a self-taught abstract artist. Uh, he's also one of the artists that have a studio at 400 uh, West Rich Street. So many of us in Columbus know that, that wonderful artist community, basically right over the bridge behind us. Um, I was really attracted to his work. When I was talking earlier about looking at that overview around, Michael's work immediately stayed with me from the very first time I saw it. And I think it's because his, his wonderful use of color I also like the idea that these paintings are that kind of micro macro, that they have this feeling of both this organic earth, but also, also this cosmic. Um, in the smaller piece, um, when you're getting to this sort of um, bullish form, you almost fall into it because of this color, this, this beautiful um, maroon and um, aqua, uh, even in the, the style of the way the paint is applied to the canvas is just very lush. Um, and I think he's, he's just very successful 
uh, with these paintings. I also like the fact that he could work at a smaller scale and the larger scale, and they both have the same presence. Absolutely. And so speaking of snaking around, uh, we have a couple more pieces by Jennifer Witten, who will be doing an artist talk next week, May 6th at noon. Um, and talk a little bit about uh, the history of this and, and why you find this so important. Sure. So I'm a sucker for Ohio history, Ohio iconology, etc. cetera. Um, when I saw these pieces, I immediately, the serpent with Ohio, the uh, Great Serpent Mound that's down uh, by the Southern Ohio, by, in Southern Ohio by the River. Uh, I love that kind of reference, or that, that's how I take these pieces. Uh, you have it as an obvious form in this work uh, with the house shape. The houses then progress over to this next piece that are on stilts, but the, um, that hilly, rolling uh, countryside there really reminds me of, you, if you do go down to the Serpent Mound, how the, the landscape is in that region of the state. You also have this wonderful serpent figure again that encircles uh, this painting of, of, of these uh, structures. The beadwork is phenomenal. Um, Amanda is uh, doing a great job of showing you this sort of detail. The control she is able to have between the, um, the actual beading, the color use, etc., I think is just masterful. Yeah, and then you have that special treat at the very end of, of realizing that that circle around it is a snake eating its own tail. Um, there's these discoveries that you have within it. Um, so it's pretty neat. So next up we have Teresa Witt. Um, and Teresa is a fiber artist, she's a quilter. And I have permission um, from Teresa. She shared with us that her works are made to be used. So she comes from a tradition, her family um, her mother and, and sister, they all quilt together. And this piece, Ken, I'm going to let you talk about kind of the process of it, but it's really important that you see the back of it. So take in this gorgeous kaleidoscope. That's all made from this one pattern. So Ken, you want to get a little sure. deeper on that? So. This is definitely another piece that when I saw it immediately, I was drawn to it. I think the use of color pattern, uh, this sort of crystallized image that is formed uh, through the uh, piecing technique, really, really caught me right off the bat. Um, again, with the exhibition, we actually received quite a bit of uh, fiber pieces, uh, which in a way didn't surprise me, because if you think about uh, fiber in itself, it's very accessible. Uh, many, many people I know quilt, they, they do uh, weaving, etc. So um, I was excited that we had many good examples of quilt making in the show. Ohio has a real history of quilt. Um, I, I'll read you quickly because I, I, I think it's better from her statement how this is actually pieced together. Uh, it took me three or four times to read it to really understand it and appreciate it, but it's constructed using only one fabric plus a background. The large print fabric is cut into six identical layers that are aligned exactly and then cut into six identical triangles. The triangles are then stitched together into hexagrams. I just think that's just an amazing technique. It sounds fairly straightforward, but when you look at this sort of complex composition that she's created, I'm just overwhelmed. I think it's just beautiful. That's perfect. And then, uh, Teresa has a couple more quilts in here. Uh, she shared with us that um, this is actually her, her family's um, uh, convalescing quilt. This is, if you're not feeling well in the Whip family, this is the quilt that you're going to snuggle up with. And like, how, how great is that to have something that beautiful to help make you feel better? Uh, but we're going to turn it over to these photographs next. So these are uh, photographs by artist uh, Dominika Jerkovic, and she is from Columbus. Uh, so again, another really great statement, but this is somebody that uh, I was thinking about when I was during this, the whole atmosphere of creating this past year or more of COVID and sort of isolation. And Dominika actually talked about in her statement that she is a, a photographer that has traveled to many countries, uh, photographs uh, extensively, etc. But because of COVID, she was restricted to her home here in central Ohio, which caused her to kind of stop and kind of take a look at her own community. And, and she was very inspired. 
Uh, these three photographs, again, a, a really beautiful series seen together, were taken at, taken at two uh, park slash uh, farm, farms, uh, the Smek Farm and the 22 Acres Farm, which are both located here uh, in central Ohio. When I, looking at the work again, I thought these would make a beautiful tri triptych. They really help to, one photograph informs the other, uh, and they're just sort of that essence of Ohio. So I was really happy uh, she applied with these pieces. All right, so we're going to come on through. So these two pieces are by Teresa, and then we have this piece by Sharon Graham, um, another just really beautiful example of that uh, elevated craft, honestly. And you know, something that Ken and I talked about, um, particularly with folks that, that uh, may not automatically share that they're an artist first, is that a really approachable um, material is something that we live in, right? We have clothing that we live in, that we, you know, sheets that we sleep in. And so there's this closeness to it that allows it to not be as scary as a white canvas, right? Um, so I really appreciate the fact that we have so many fiber pieces in this work. So yet another fiber piece. Um, <laughs> and actually I have to uh, compliment Kat in the Rife Gallery. I think the exhibition is really beautiful because I think uh, being here in person, you really see how the work speaks back and forth to each other, how they inform each other, even though, you know, this quilt over here is much more traditional. This is incredibly contemporary. It's actually not necessarily a quilt, but a, a fiber art piece. <clears throat> this is a work by um, Amanda Graver from here in Columbus. It's entitled Emergent. Uh, it features a found photograph that she digitally uh, altered and then printed onto individual fabric pieces. Uh, the pieces were sewn together, hand stitched, was applied to the surface, and then she included a variety of colors of mica and glass flakes uh, to add to the brightness of the sky and the water. Um, it just, I thought this piece again was really beautiful. Again, I'm a sucker for found photos, uh, having this applied to the cloth. Um, this object, a uh, tentacle almost, coming out of the water, uh, emergent, uh, the title really uh, connects to the piece. And um, the use of mica, I think, is really uh, kind of original and unique. And in the gallery, and hopefully you're seeing it right now, it has this beautiful re reflective quality that makes this, this small fiber art piece really shine in the gallery. You really, um, you, you approach it and really appreciate that texture. So thinking about the fact that Ken uh, shared with us being in the space and seeing that relationship of the works, um, while we're not able to be open uh, for folks, we do have a 360 tour that you can check out on lifegallery.org. And you can actually take yourself right through the gallery and, and take your time and unravel this exhibition in a really meaningful way. Um, so let's, let's hit our next one here. This is another photograph that we're gonna take a look at. So this is a work by Janet Hall from Asheville. Uh, she's with the Attorney General's Office. Uh, a lot of photography uh, was submitted this year and I tried to pick things that showed a, a real variety. This in image actually really surprised me. I, I really liked it initially because of the color, the composition. I, I love how this uh, plain uh, wing intercepts the upper third of the, the photograph, but there's a wonderful surprise that I didn't initially see when I was juring of this small um, circle around the shadow of the plane in the clouds. So uh, initially I thought maybe Photoshop, it's still kind of really beautiful. And then I learned it was not. This is an actual occurrence. Uh, another thing I learned from going online uh, after reading Janet's, uh, Janet's statement. Uh, so the piece is entitled Glory and a glory is an optical phenomenon resembling an iconic saint's halo. It is caused by sunlight or moonlight interacting with tiny water droplets that comprise a mist or clouds. So talk about finding that perfect moment. Uh, I thought this was just a wonderful uh, photograph. And, and um, again, each time I looked at it, each time I learned more about it, I just really appreciate it even further. That's, yeah, it really encapsulates the idea of photography in and of itself, like this moment in time that 
probably could never be captured. Well, in that case, certainly could never be captured sure. again. No. So let's uh, let's come around the corner a bit, and we have um, another work by someone who we'll have some programming with. Uh, Jonathan Grimm will have an artist talk on Thursday, June seventeenth, in the evening. Um, but I'm going to let you talk about this work. Sure. So here's a work that I overlooked a number of rounds. Uh, I kept it because I just thought it was unique in its own way. And um, as I learned and, and viewed it more and more, I really began to appreciate uh, the actual image itself. Um, it's, it's a very interestingly made piece. Uh, it's by Jonathan Grimm, who's, who's from Columbus. It's entitled Star Trails Over the Fence. It's a digital photograph which layers 201 images to create the illusion of the stars moving through the night sky. He also has used LED lights to just highlight the fence here that grounds uh, this work. So you can almost envision yourself in the backyard looking up at the sky and seeing this wonderful, these streaming uh, circular forms of the stars. Uh, it's just a beautiful photograph. The, the other thing that I really find interesting about that too, Ken, is that it, it uh, describes passage of time as well. Um, there's this kind of magic to it and imagining um, the stars moving or you actually you moving um, slowly is, is pretty phenomenal. It, it's a little bit hard to see um, through a, a phone, but uh, we have some great images that you can take a look at on RifeGallery.org. So, uh... Again, having the fortune of being here in the gallery, there's been this wonderful way of curating a series of photographs on this wall that have um, really show a, sort of this dynamic range of the possibilities of photography. Um, we had a few people that applied that were doing documentary photography, uh, but this work by, um, sorry, uh, Andrew Miller, Andrew Miller uh, really stuck out with me. So Andrew is a real renaissance man. He's from Columbus. He works at the Department of Administrative Services. But uh, he is not only a photographer, he's an essayist. He's a poet. He's a journalist. So I'm glad that uh, his photography was able to be included in this exhibition because he's act act actually one of those people that when we talk about after hours, he's a busy guy. He does a lot of things. His work focuses on issues related to labor and social justice and the celebration of the working class lives. This image is of Mexico City in the evening, and I think he's done a wonderful job of capturing this sort of active, um, just really dense city life that is happening. We have a, a woman off to the right here in movement, this grouping of men playing cards, and then over to your left, you have this busy urban street with cars coming down. I also appreciated his use of light. He has two, three different sources of light that illuminate this image. It's really quite amazing. I'm going to um, pull us over to the corner here. We have a concentration of OAC artists here. So this is Katie Davis here. Um, and Katie and I had a really lovely conversation on the Ohio Arts Council's arts chat. If you want to take a listen, it's about 10 minutes long where we talk about our process. And what I loved about these works is that um, she's been exploring redlining and that kind of history and working that into her works and then decided within her works that she needed to uh, expand off of the canvas. So quite literally encompassing and installing, uh, there's just something so tactile and interesting to, to imagine works that become a part of the space. Um, and then over here we have Amy Wisman, and I'm gonna make sure that I call this the middleman, a wolf in sheep's clothes. Um, Amy is an artist who has layer upon layer, not only of media, but me, uh, meaning within her work. Um, so really excited to have that. And then over here next to us, a part of the work that we have in the Ohio Arts Council is really grounded in being participants in the culture. So trying our hand at it, um, going to art events, experiencing it. So uh, Jim had this painting that he made uh, at a workshop from a exhibition earlier on, a plein air exhibition that was at the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Gallery. So pretty fun. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ken. So um, these are two paintings by Beth uh, Malkus Staffa. 
Uh, she's from Columbus and works at the Public Health Department. Um, again, when we were doing images, I was immediately taken with the color palette and the expressive use of the paint. Um, they were actually created through a 13-step layering acrylic paint process, uh, which the artist uses until the, these images uh, emerge. And if you actually get up close to the surface, you do see this wonderful sort of um, translucent use of color. Uh, images that I were, was really compelled seeing digitally, but when I came here to the gallery and saw them in kind of real life, they are just really beautiful. Uh, the surface has a lot of texture to it, which I like, and you really get to experience that, um, the use of color and the translucency that uh, she's able to create within these paintings. They're so vibrant in person. Like you can't quite get that feel when you look at them digitally, but um, through video and through seeing them in person, it's just extraordinary. The, the, there's scintillation that happens where the, the colors just vibrate off of each other. Um, and my colleague is gonna be angry at me if I don't point us in this angle. So these works over here in this corner are by Kat Sheridan, who is also me. Um, that's Barbara Fant and Dion Pester Edwards and Lisa McClimate, who are all phenomenal artists here in Columbus, Ohio, who push us to be a better city um, and enrich everything about it. So that's enough about that. So I'm going to bring Amanda all the way over here to this corner. We're, we're unfortunately not able to talk about every piece in the exhibition, so I encourage you to go online and, and use the various uh, tools that they've created so that you can experience the collection on your own. Um, this painting by Steve uh, Nassano, who is from Cincinnati and works for the De Department of Co uh, Corrections. Uh, Steve actually applied with two bridge paintings and a painting that was of the uh, hillside by the Ohio River. It really has that Cincinnati, Southern Ohio feel to it. Uh, but we're, what also really drew me to these, these paintings, and specifically this painting, is his dense use of paint and the colors he's able to achieve um, in, in his paintings. Uh, Steve is actually one of the artists that has previously also been included in this exhibition in, in past years. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, so I was you know, definitely drawn to the image but I began reading all the statements, and when I read his statement, it really, um, really struck me. Uh, the, the idea of this exhibition is after hours, so it's, it's artists who are also employees of the state of Ohio who work these day-to-day -day jobs uh, that are probably not as expressive and or necessarily counting on your creative talents to, to do. Steve's statement, and I'll, I'll read it to you directly, um, I paint oil paintings to relax. My job as a correctional office officer at a level three prison is stressful. So it's not only the exhibition is talking about, you know, what do you do after hours? What are you doing when you get home from your day job? But in this case, it's actually using art therapeutically to kind of release all of that day-to-day -day stress and, and just create these wonderful images, these paintings. Yeah, I love the generosity of material in that. Uh, exactly, if you get a little bit sideways on the painting, you can almost see where there's that magical texture that comes out, um, the almost mixing that happens on the painting that's really unique. So I'm gonna bring Amanda around here. Um, we have two more portraits and probably figuring it out by now, I'm really drawn to portraits, to figures, um, and I thought these were also another wonderful different uh, addition, a different approach to the portrait. Uh, these are two pieces by Rochelle Snow, who is from Columbus. She's with uh, the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, and she entitles this series Penny Fro. Um, the pieces are multimedia, mixed media. Uh, the faces are beautifully rendered in paint, but then we get to the to these um, hairstyles, these afros, that are created with pennies, found objects. Um, so again, in the digital image, I thought they were wonderful. They provided um, this wonderful surface. In this case, I love how they break the square. They continue over the edge, but then in, in here in person in the gallery, I begin to notice the patina she is using. So she, she's placed these sort of darker patinaed um, pennies that are closer to the face and then used that kind of variation 
to draw you out to this sort of brighter composition at the top. I think it's uh, just a beautiful textural um, piece. So smartly done. So this is another one of the pieces, and this is by, sorry, uh, Rachel, Rochelle Smith, um, who is from Columbus and works at the Ohio School for the Blind. Um, I really misinterpreted this piece when I saw it online the very first time. I, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the faces. I thought it was a very different approach. Uh, I could tell that she was using clay, a different media. Um, but I, when I actually saw it in person, I realized the scale I had in my mind was completely wrong. And um, there's such a delicacy to each of these pieces. When I read her statement, I had that kind of aha moment. Um, uh, she said that she, um, she enjoys the simplicity of, found in natural forms, such as the human face. In this work, she was exploring expression and the idea of isolation within the community. It is also of the isolation created during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a point that I was like, that, that, that's right on. Each face is unique, yet there are still similarities that connect them to one another. And that's really subconsciously what I was taking away from the piece when I first saw it, is there are similarities, but then they also began to, to become individual. But there's a, quite a variety, and the idea that she was saying is the idea of isolation during COVID, but still connected. And Ken, you were talking a little bit about how it makes so much sense that it, it's such a tactile piece and the nature of her work and, and kind of seeing that bridge as well. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, the, the other really nice thing about this exhibition is that, you know, we have music represented, um, we have visual works represented, um, fiber works, uh, a couple of three-dimensional works. We also have poetry as a part of this. So really and truly the arts um, thrive through all of our communities and also through state workers. So, you know, having a look at, at Chuck Salmon's work, um, that's a photo that he took himself and then his poem on top of it. Now I won't, I won't take the time to read through it. You can catch that online, but I wanted to make sure that we highlighted the fact that we celebrate all sorts of different kinds of um, artistic forms. So I'm so pleased to have this piece in the show. Um, there wasn't a lot of applicants in 3D, so I'm looking out to the next time the, the Rife Gallery hosts After Hours to all you artists that are doing 3D work or working in 3D, please, please apply. This piece really made me smile when I saw it. It's very simple, straightforward, you know, just a beautiful color, whimsical. Um, so I read the statement, and in the statement, the artist, who is Aaron Higgins from Columbus, Department of Medicaid, uh, the piece was inspired by the artist grandmother's uh, elephant collection. Uh, the other thing that kind of jumped out at me from her statement was Eric began taking ceramic classes at the Columbus Cultural Arts Center in 2014, and she really wrote about this enjoyment of working with the instructor, instructors and learning, and ver learning various techniques uh, through taking classes there. Ohio is incredibly fortunate to have so many cultural arts centers and um, museums and many other access points to the arts that are funded through the Ohio Arts Council. Um, it provides everybody, uh, the, general, uh, the general public, access to the arts and the ability to explore their creative side. Uh, I also uh, am taking a class at the Cultural Arts Center right now, so I really related to her uh, work and uh, to her talk or her expression in her artist statement. It's a wonderful space. It really takes you out of the everyday world and the value that all these institutions provide to Ohio and, and the citizens is beyond uh, comprehension. I mean, it's just a phenomenal network of maker sites that are available to anyone. So um, just to note, we're, we're kind of to the end of what we're talking about as far as the pieces, but I want to give some space and time for questions. So Ken and I are going to talk a little bit more about the importance of exhibitions like this, but if you have any questions, please drop them into the comments and we'll get to them. So Ken, talk a little bit more about why you think it's important to highlight uh, non-traditional non artists or um, to have an exhibition like this. Tell me more about that. So I think this, this show is pretty wonderful because it really has the range of beginning makers 
to truly experienced exhibiting artists that are, are important to our state. Uh, it's an access point. And I think the other thing that's important about this exhibition is it does provide an opportunity to bridge and bring these people all together in a common space. Uh, the exhibition, I think, is really uh, uh, laid out very beautifully. I think the work talks to each other. Um, in the back corner where we were, there's a series of photographs. They're all different approaches, but when you actually stand back from that wall and you look, there's a relationship. There's a reason these four images are together. Uh, for the general public and for definitely the uh, people that work in the Rife and the Roads, even though with COVID uh, we haven't had as much access, I think it provides them a different side to the people they work with. To come into this gallery and realize that these are, you know, co-workers that are also have this sort of other life that is being exhibited in this exhibition is just this wonderful, um, just a wonderful thing to, to have to be able to, to provide to the public. Um, as the individual artist coordinator previously at the Ohio Arts Council, the thing that I uh, was very fortunate and, and loved was to travel around the state for the um, Percent Fire program to have meetings, but then to be able to go to the various institutions in those communities and to view the artwork uh, in their galleries. Uh, I have found that the artist uh, within the locale of the uh, space, so the idea of like uh, Southern Ohio Museum in Portsmouth, it's beloved by the community. When they do a cream of the crop show that will be coming up soon here this summer, uh, it's a call to artists within a 90 mile. 90 mile radius. I go down to that show and I see work I've never seen anywhere else. It's because the artists really have ownership over those institutions. There's a trust, there's a bond with them. And so those exhibitions are just, uh, just phenomenal uh, resources to look at art and to see what's being produced within the region of a community. Yeah, I love that you talked about access point. Um, and I think that that's a really important piece of an exhibition um, like this that really highlights the creativity from artists from around the state. Uh, it helps folks to recognize that it's nascent. It's a part of all of our communities. It's a part of all of our workplaces. We all know artists, whether we know it or not. Um, and I also love to think about it in the way of uh, recognizing that we all contain multitudes. Like we can be this really um, phenomenally type A, get these things done during the day, and then we can also really drive into our creativity and, and have what may also be very type, type A and, and labor intensive and very um, focused work or super loose. You know, you, there, there's this idea of artwork as um, kind of maybe therapy or um, as meditation, but also I like to think about it as communication. So I think about quilting in that way when we were talking about uh, our artists that, that use those as necessary to be used. That is an absolute communication of love. So thinking about how, you know, how much time and every stitch that's put into that with the intention of use of something beautiful. Um, you know, with our, with the elephant, thinking about uh, that artist's mother who collected elephants and now um, she's creating this access point for herself in, in the actual iteration of that. It's just really beautiful to think about. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the one thing that really um, drew me to this show too is so many of the pieces that are created here are incredibly personal to the maker. Um, and I, I know with every artist, there is some personal connection to why you're creating what you're making. But I think there's this almost raw edge um, that is exposed here that I, I've read about in a statement or just looking at the work that uh, it's very compelling. Uh, it really makes this show special because it's providing a different side to the people that are actually represented here in the gallery. Those people that serve the state, that serve constituents here. Um, thinking about it in that way too. I love the idea of, of creating broader access and understanding through the people that are represented in this exhibition too. Um, when folks start to see people that they, they wouldn't automatically put uh, the mantle of artists on within this exhibition and see the extraordinary talent that they have, um, it helps to personalize the artists. It removes um, 
that barrier to entry. It helps you see it as a part of your community, which is quite beautiful. And I think we're coming close to um, no questions, not Lots a single of comments. Oh, we have many comments. comments. Thank you. Let's read some comments. All right. Um, Kimberly Chapman said in reference to Michael Bush's paintings that she loves the cosmic light paintings and that they're stunning. Uh, Michael High said amazing beadwork and shapes inside shapes in reference to Jennifer Witten's work. Janelle Hallett mentioned that she always wants to see the backs of quilts and she's so impressed um, about Jennifer Witt. Donna Collins complimented Dominika Jerkovic's work, saying beautiful images from Ohio farmlands. Um, more comments, nice, talented group of people. Leslie mentioned that she really wishes she could see these in person, but you've done a fantastic job and she will go watch the virtual tour. Christina Andrews, one of our exhibiting artists, said wonderful pieces this year, so many talented individuals. Chuck Sammons, another um, exhibiting artist, said, I'm so honored to be in this a uh, fantastic exhibition. Congratulations to Ken, Kat, and everyone at the Wright for doing such a great job. Thank you all and all the artists for your hard work and creativity. Uh, Leslie mentioned that Jennifer Witten's beading is amazing. Dominika Jerkovic said, thank you for doing this virtual tour. So many talented artists. Uh, Brenda Likala, another one of our exhibiting artists, said so many talented artists. Just wish we could see it in person. And if there are no more questions, can you talk about what you liked about some of the pieces didn't already talk about. Oh yeah, sure, we can do that. Okay, um, I'm going to take you one to to a piece that, in a digital format, I thought it was a really unfortunate documentation of the work, and I struggled and I kept looking at it. And uh, it's this piece here. It's uh, oh Jennifer Smith from Reynoldsburg, Department of Commerce. So digitally, when I was looking at this image, it seemed like it was a kind of blurred painting. Uh, definitely compelling of these firefighters. Uh, they are actually firefighters of Station 5, five um, that were um, en route to fight a fire. So compelling image, uh, et cetera, but the, the or compelling subject, but the image was really holding me back. I, I just got feeling said, you know, let's keep it in, let's, you know, just, because I, I thought it was different and, and it needed to be here. I came into the gallery and was knocked over, primarily because it's not a painting. I mean, it is a painting, but it's not in the traditional sense. She is using uh, this uh, diamond. Yeah, these are essentially crystals that are placed uh, to announce color and differentiate color through <clears throat> that kind of placement. Like it, 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 to kind of make it in layman's terms, if you think about paint by number, it has a similar kind of attention to that. Our eyes will blur colors together to create variation. So you see um, where you have this really lovely mauve to a, a very like light cream to a yellow. And that, if, as you pull away from that, that gives you the description of a wall. Whereas when you get closer to it, there are each individual um, little crystals, essentially. I mean, here, you, you, as you get, if you're really, really close, it's almost like you think about it like Monet, right? You get real close and there's this abstraction that happens. And then you pull away and it, it reveals. Um, so there's something really fun about that. And, and no matter where you're standing in the gallery, you're having a different experience. It, it really is dependent on the light and point of view. So, wonderful piece. I'm glad I didn't, I'm yeah. glad I included it. <laughs> but so. the, the other thing that you had mentioned the other day, too, is that there is this um, connection to light, right? Like these, these show up and shine in a way. And so you think about light and you think about fire, and there's this really kind of melding of meaning and material in a very unique way. It's um, very, very creative approach yeah, to, to, to figuring out the subject. Well, you, you had some comments on, yeah. Well, um, so here's our best combination of both the idea of quilting and fiber and portraiture and painting. Um, so this is, um, I'm gonna, Totally slaughter your name, Mary or Molly, but I apologize. So it's Molly Trespakowski. She's from Columbus, the Department of Taxation. Uh, it, it represents two women 
who actually taught Molly to quilt. So this is honor, a painter honoring this sort of passing down of, uh, of art. Uh, the painting uses uh, the geometry of the quilting to reveal her subtle feeling toward, toward these women and the idea of uh, the quilt journey, journey that she is taking and her source, the teachers. Uh, I thought it was one of those wonderful connector pieces that uh, talked about art, talked about history, talked about why this, uh, why Molly was uh, encouraged to become creative, part of the quilting community. And um, so I thought it was just, like I said, a really good bridge piece to include in the, in the exhibition. And then right next to it, uh, Kat has included a quilt. So, and then on this piece, and I know, I'm sorry, I don't have the artist's so name. Alyssa Hedges. I'm sorry? Alyssa Hedges. So we were both talking about this before. This, this piece, when I first saw it, I was like, Wow, that's familiar. Well, it kind of reflects the state of Ohio, the, the seal. You have the sunrise here, with the, and then this, these rays of um, stitching that come from the piece. Um, and it's one of those good examples of how you use stitching to create surface, composition, to draw the eye, um, to break the triangle. So um, it's really kind of nice that these two pieces are paired together. Let's go and um, chat about Robin Schaefer's work. Uh, those were really surprising to get to see the depth of them um, as, as they came in. Um, and there, there was this really fun discovery, and Robin, please forgive me if I'm not allowed to do this, but we found out that if you just softly touch that, there's this uh, additional movement of this created world. Um, and you look at these layers happening, that just the extraordinary detail and uh, phenomenal hand skills that it takes to cut those and, and place them together. And then to have these pieces back here, uh, to, you know, digitally you see them straight on, but in person you can get to the side and just see these layers. It's, it's nearly like a, um, a, a relief, a bas relief. Um, so there's some history in that. And I love that it's an abstraction as well as a representation. There's like an M.C. Escher feel to them. Um, just really so playful, but also very serious. You can't not be a little serious and, and make work like this. What do you think, Ken? I, I totally agree. I think the, the documentation that I saw initially, while I could see the depth, um, you know, by nature it flattened it up. So we're coming into the gallery and experiencing it live. Uh, it's been pretty wonderful. Just like I said on the, on the um, crystal piece, when you come over here and you look at these pieces, every time you move around them, you get a different point of view, different information. Uh, th these are so precise. You have to admire the artist's craftsmanship. Uh, when we uh, talk about the globe and, and uh, Kat made it vibrate, uh, or kinetic. Uh, again, the pieces that are, um, are kind of projecting out of the globe uh, have this wonderful 3D quality, but then when you're actually looking at the surface and the collaging that she was able to do, and actually the color composition on the piece, it's quite taking. Uh, you know, it's just beautiful. Um, I'm looking at these strips of uh, information in the paper and uh, seeing that they're maps. So, uh, She's created a pattern with them, with the, top, I can't say the word, top, topography, uh, <laughs> lines that are created. So in a way, it almost even references printmaking. Yeah, and uh, if you want to hear more about Robin's work, um, Robin is going to be another of our, our artist, artist talks on Thursday, July 1st at noon. So you should tune into that as well. Um, and we've covered nearly all of the works in the exhibition, and I know lots of you probably have to get back to work now, so if we don't have any additional questions, I want to take the time to, number one, thank you all for joining us, holding tight with us, um, enjoying this exhibition with us. Ken, big, big thank you for thank doing you. the work of journeying this exhibition and allowing us to have these works that so nicely work together. I also want to thank the Ohio legislature for supporting this really unique space that allows us to not only exhibit but amplify the voices of Ohio artists. Um, and Ken, do you have anything else you want to say? Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I encourage you to look at the other online sources for the exhibition. Thank you to Kat and to Amy and um, Amanda and to the entire OAC staff who I really miss dearly. 
Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to participate in this program, and I look forward to seeing the next exhibition in four years. Yes, every so. four years. Thank you so much. Thank Take you. care.